Hi, welcome to the Iris Prize 2020 podcast. We love everything about queer film, and this year we're all about Best of British. I'm Robert Gershenson, and I'm joined by filmmaker Abel Rubenstein. His short film, Dungarees, is shortlisted for the 2020 Iris Prize Best of British, supported by Film 4. The winner of the prize will get a package from Pinewood Studios to use on their next short film, and all 15 shortlisted films will get a UK-wide release via Film 4 on all four. Abel, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, thank you for coming. Your film, Dungarees, it poses the question, what does it actually mean to be a male, not a man, because that's sex? This film's about gender. So what inspired the film? Well, I was at a time in, I guess, in my life where I started started to explore with my femininity myself um, and my boyfriend is trans and we were just talking about what it means to be a man and how, in fact, it means so little. (laughs) And I knew how hard it was for him to choose to show any femininity because society he wanted to be accepted by society as a man and he thought if he wore nail varnish that would sort of society wouldn't accept him as that and I wanted to just explore those feelings on film um and how hard it could be to transition and whilst exploring your femininity yeah you're how old 21 22 22 22 so you're part of an age group that typically don't do labels. How do you feel about the whole idea of putting a label on people, on things, on gender? Um, there's there's levels. Um, I think in many ways labels are empowering because we mm-hmm. can find community and we can sort of band together. But equally, I think there's space for both. If, if I think not having a label and you can sort of be under the queer umbrella and be accepted into a family. And I find that really important. Do you mind if I ask how you identify? I'm a gay man. A gay man. Yeah. (laughs) So when you introduce yourself and you introduce your partner, what sort of reaction do you get from people? Do they just initially put a label on the pair of you or one of you? How does that conversation go? I mean, it depends in which situation. I mean, we've been called the F word in pubs. <laughs> it depends where you are, really. Mm-hmm. We've been shouted out in the street. But um, generally, with amongst friends, we're just like a couple. <laughs> and that's how I like to be seen, just a normal couple. And that's what I want to do with my films, really, is normalize all different types of relationships. And this is one of them. How long have you been with your partner? Coming up to three and a half years or so. So yeah. prior to that, had you had any connection with the trans community? Um, just through the queer community, I've just got lots of um, queer friends and that's basically my connection. Um, like my cinematographer is good friends of Pete who acted in the film. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's a whole vibrant community online and in London. Well, let's talk about Pete and let's talk about the film. In, in this respect, there's a lot of nudity or semi-nudity. How do you ensure that your two lead characters who pretty much spend the entire film in their underwear, how do you ensure that they are comfortable on screen doing the sort of things romping around that you've asked them to do? And in the case of Pete, who is a female to male trans actor, he is topless and his top surgery scars are on full display for mainstream audiences they're not going to be used to that so how do you make sure that the actors are comfortable i mean i think it's just a lot about having a conversation and i mean speaking to be i think we created a safe sort of queer space and we talked at length about the character and why we're doing this Mm -hmm. and he was so fully behind the idea the idea and it was actually an experience that's not so dissimilar to his own um so when we're just like shooting in a little bedroom we just 
I tried to get as much crew out the room as possible and just give them space. And I think we all knew why we were there. Yeah. And I also gave Pete a lot of space to improvise and bring his own experiences to the character that can add to my writing. So to make sure it, it was real. Um, so so we just felt like everybody could speak up and if anything was wrong, um, it would be heard. I think as an opening image, it's 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 revolutionary. It's quite radical. It's not something you would normally see, like I said, in the mainstream. So I think the fact that this is your this this film Dungarees is going to film at the London Film Festival, right? So I think in that context, it's going to be amazing, right? That's going to be such a great opportunity, not just for you and for your team, but for the idea of what it actually means to be a trans person. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's crazy because um, I don't even see it in that way. I don't see it as radical because it's my almost everyday life of just mm. knowing and speaking about these things. So, But if you imagine uh, there's a yeah. certain group of you know audience members across the country who probably only watch ITV on a Sunday night. Yeah. So yeah. If, if these trans people are not appearing uh, topless or... or or any other way, in a 60s set police drama <laughs> set in Yorkshire, they're not going to have exposure to this. Yeah. So suddenly your film comes along in a mainstream, straight film festival. That's a radical thing. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it is. I have had a few people mention to me that how they thought it changed their minds about things and opened their eyes to what being trans is. And in a way, I didn't really again i didn't think of it as a radical thing and almost just showing a life i think can be radical in a way because all we set out to do is tell their story their love story are you happy that your film might have that effect yeah and i think it empowers people to say that it's okay and a big thing about the sort of nudity in the film is i wanted to show all the different types of bodies mm. that there are and show and almost not not like overly sexualize anything. There's lots of films out there that like Tarantino loves feet. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I just wanted to show the bodies in their pure form and not try and um, alter it in any way. It doesn't feel like you're exploiting anyone. It Good. feels very <laughs> natural. And even when I, I've watched it maybe five or six times now in prep for this. And in fact, this morning over tea, <laughs> um, it feels very natural. It feels reasonably documentary-like. Did that come out of the writing? Was it completely scripted? Or was it a case of you had some plot points and you said to the actors, I just want you to be in the moment but hit these marks? Um, so I, it was entirely scripted, but um, I knew all along that the pages... Uh, the the writing on the page was completely advisory only yeah. and um so my first proper like meeting with the actors is we went to the pub and we went for a pint and we just chatted about our own experiences and um how we identified um and how they can bring their own experiences to the film and it was a constant thing a, a reminder to them of i've written these words on the page but I want you to bring these characters alive and um I want you to interrupt each other I want it you to be awkward not finish your sentences and to be um, real yeah exactly so from those initial meetings did you then go do another draft on the script adding in what you'd learned no I mean it's almost like um what well, we we rehearsed it and rehearsed it and uh, we just tried to put aside the script mm. um we can we used it as a slight reminder but um mostly i wanted to be able to just like almost throw it away it was like our leaping pad to create something new i didn't okay. want them to rely on words like an extra draft yeah uh, okay what's your writing process like do you find it like banging your head against a wall yeah <laughs> um yeah i'm writing a new script um called samples jake and i'm going through so many drafts, so many drafts um, to make sure that the storyline is right. Um, even though I know that when it comes to filming, I'm going to like disregard a lot of what I've written on the page, but I find it really important to get the story arc 
there and the mm-hmm. character development perfect before adding to it and do you do a lot of research before actually sitting down to actually type yeah i mean because the the, the stories that i'm telling are quite close to home it comes from sort of speaking to friends and seeing how their experiences are compared mm-hmm. to my own and um just get different perspectives um so yeah so you, i mean you only go to your friends for their perspectives yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but like for their like background let's so say like for the latest one um it's a lot about um our experience of coming out as gay mm-hmm. um at a young age and then sort of sleeping around with older men and how that's affected us whilst being older and whether it was almost slightly abusive situations um and i've spoken to lots of my friends um and they've actually gone through quite similar things because when you come out at like 14 um you're the your, your only options are date the in the closet straight boy or the um old men on grinder and um it was just sort of unpacking what effects those experiences have so so that's what this new short film is going to be about yeah yeah but in like a very like similar social realist character based way and it's a short not a feature short yeah it's a short how are you as a director how did you find your directing style um i'm really inspired by um directors like Lucas Moodison and Sebastian Schipper. Mm-hmm. Um, Sebastian Schipper did Victoria. It's um, a film in Berlin and it was done in one shot. Mm-hmm. He said like the most incredible thing that's always stuck, stuck with me is he told the actors never to do the same action twice, um, which I find really scary because it's because there's like no micromanagement in that but um but then also how'd you cut it together (laughs) yeah (laughs) but it's like um it basically means that you're you're allowing the actors to not get in stuck of oh that that movement Mm. was good so let me try and replicate that because then there's a sense of falseness to it and i just love that i want to i want to show like life and reality um so those directors are incredible at capturing that so i'm just trying to be as daring as i can to um just show off people and who they are do you feel you're in your groove do you feel you found your lane or do you feel it beginning to form a bit of both in the next film i want to be more cinematic and i want to but at the same time it's every single story has a has its own purpose of and way of telling it definitely in the acting sense Mm -hmm. but um i want to explore different cinematic ways of telling the story how did you cast this film did you did you know pete and what's the other actor's name um ludovic ludovic did you know them before i knew pete and he's fantastic and i've seen him in a few things Mm -hmm. as well as an iris prize short (laughs) yeah um and he's fantastic and i tried to audition a few different other people but i kind of knew that he was the one um and then i got a casting director on board and he helped me find the other two characters but it was all about making sure that the two characters could have a bond on screen yeah and so did that come from a rehearsal period it was like a rehearsal period we did it in the roundhouse which was lovely but i've been then, um in camden yeah yeah um but then um the main thing was like the beers and seeing if they got along <laughs> um, yeah. so you got funding through roundhouse yeah yeah how what's that process like yeah it was fun it was just um a little treatment and script that i sent to them um it was a little budget um but it, what are we talking it was well, I got six hundred and sixty pounds in the end, but then I That's all right. Yeah, it's all right. Um I saved up a bit of my money to um top it up a little bit. So what did you top it up by? It went to like a grand or something. Okay. So yeah. a a grand is is a nice solid amount yeah. to make a film. But what sort of guidance do they give you? Um, yeah, it was fantastic really. They set me up with a mentor at BFI Network, mm-hmm. um, Cara Davison and yeah, they were very supportive and we could, we use like their amazing 
audition space, which is like a huge room. We felt very professional. <laughs> <laughs> How do people apply for that? Is that an annual thing? Yeah, um, it's called the And Now What Film Fund. And Now What Film Front? Film Fund. Film Fund. Yeah. Um, just rolls off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, just go to their website, I think, and they shout about it. It's Is there an age year. limit? I think the age limit might be um, 25. 25. But don't quote me on that. <laughs> good age um okay so you were the editor on this podcast so when you're on set are you already cutting in your head are you you know how does that inform your decisions um it gives me a sense of freedom because i know what i can and can't do mm -hmm. in a way i know that i'm gonna be the one struggling with the footage <laughs> um i knew i was gonna do lots of jump cuts with um this film which allowed me to add to this sort of improvisation. Yeah. So I said to the actors and kept on reminding them, don't worry if you go off on a tangent, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump cut this and that's going to be part of the style. So I want you to just keep on acting no matter what and add in your own words and do your own thing mm -hmm. and don't worry. Yeah. And when did you realize you were happy with the final cut? I don't think you ever are. <laughs> <laughs> oh really yeah no for so sure. even now you'd want to tinker yeah well if you sent me back the footage i'll probably make some better changes yeah <laughs> um yeah no it's the worst to like finally say that you're done with a film was it a hard edit yeah it was very hard <laughs> was it long yeah yeah i spent like months and months on it um yeah it's just about get because then you get too involved with it it's like every single frame um is life and death if it's wrong or right but then you get different eyes on it and they go what are you talking about is good <laughs> I'm like are you sure but how do you ensure that you're stepping back and and seeing the whole wood it, yeah it's very hard to do that but you just get um people's eyes on it that you trust mm -hmm. um and it's just trial and error really um lots of error and then hopefully you'll get there in the end okay so let's go back where did you grow up? Um, in North London. Um, yeah. In... And you were a cinema kid? I was like a dyslexic kid who liked to write stories <clears throat> um, and hated academia. And at, basically at A-level, I did media and I really started to find my love for film then. Yeah. What films were you watching that started to get those gears going? I mean, We Are the Best is like one of my favorite films by Lucas Mujerson. Mm -hmm. um, it's about three punk kids um, in Sweden and it's incredible. And yeah, that kind of character driven storytelling. Did that inspire your film Wink? In a way, yeah, yeah. Um, that film is more of like an experimental fun one. Um, and it's on BBC iPlayer, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there was a sense of I just wanted to talk about queer spaces, but I wanted also to see if the straight world could take a joke. <laughs> and could sure. they? Not on their YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but what, what was the initial, I mean, what was the, the, you know, everyone has this big spark when they see a film or they see a particular thing that says, oh, that, that's, yeah, I'm going to do that. What was that for you? Was it this, this punk film? How do you mean? Uh, seeing that film i mean it's tricky i just knew that um of course like we are the best like lit up my brain like wow i love this um but in an entertainment sense or in a sense that said you say oh this is the sort of thing i want to do i want to be a filmmaker and it wants to look like this <laughs> yeah i don't think life is ever that quite simple i wish we had like these more like lit up moments but um, to me, filmmaking was the only thing that um, like really engaged me in storytelling that mm. um, I just knew that I really wanted to, it was the only thing that I was good at. <laughs> so <laughs> you plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What were the first steps? Did you start writing? Did you start making short films? I started writing, but the main thing for me, I, I applied to the BFI Film Academy. Yeah. Um, and I got in with like loads of different young creatives and we made like a little short film. And from there, 
I managed to do lots of networking and got on like some film sets and I was like, wow. Which film sets? <laughs> lots of different short films. Um, Rob Savage, um, he's a director and I, he kind of mentored me with the producer and mm -hmm. his short films, Verity and Dawn of the Deaf. How are you with the schmoozing, with the networking? <laughs> um, I'm all right, yeah. It's a bit weird under lockdown, isn't it? Because you just have to send these emails. But um, otherwise, especially if there's free drinks, well, free it's kind of dangerous. Helps. It's dangerous, though, because you have one, two, and then you find your sweet spot where you can <laughs> talk to anyone and you're wonderful and charismatic. But then if you have one more, yeah. <laughs> it's all messed up. It's all out the window. Yeah. Did you go to film school? No, I didn't. No. You didn't want to? I, I applied and I did interviews. Um, to which ones? Like Bournemouth, Norwich. Um, but then each time I was like, I could go, but then I could just make my own short. And I just had like yearly crisis of like, what am I doing with my life? I should probably go to uni and then go, actually, no, it's okay. I think I'm doing all right. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, are you still in that headspace? Not anymore, no. I think... There's a part of me who thinks that NFTS could be good, but... Um, mm -hmm. And pricey. Yeah, well, exactly. Do you have um, 20 grand to spare? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Vice, the hip and cool website, mm -hmm. called your work uh, poignant and sweet, but also hilarious. And they put you on their list of 10 young filmmakers to watch out for at the BFI Future Film Festival 2019. <laughs> that's got to blow your mind. Yeah, that's very cool. <laughs> Does that put pressure on you to live up to something like that? Yeah, although I think people forget. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm just in a, it's a weird world. I just watched um, the Charlie Kaufner. Is, that's not his name. Oh, Charlie Kaufner. Uh, yeah, on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm going to destroy you or something. Or No, no, no. No, no, that's a no, good no, one. No. But it's something like that. It's I'm similar. thinking of ending things. That's it. Yeah. And it was really like bizarre and it's just like, what's the meaning of life? And um, um, that we're, it just made me think as well about what really matters. And um, so it's not really about living up to stuff that you've done. I think mm -hmm. when it comes down to it, you're, a, you're sitting in your room or something and you've got a blank page in front of you and you're just trying to tell the best story you can. Um, and that's what I try and bring it down to. So. Do you see yourself represented in films and TV shows? Well, definitely growing up, no. Slightly better now. <laughs> um, but what, what queer stuff were you watching growing up? I watched Queer as Folk. <laughs> the British one or the American one? Um, the British one. British one. Yeah, yeah. And you enjoyed it? Yeah, that was great. <laughs> How old were you when you watched it? Um, must have been like 14, 15. So yeah. this is like five, six, seven years ago? Yeah, yeah. So did it, I mean... I mean, it blew my mind. I was like, wow, there's gayness in the world. <laughs> I'm <laughs> so not alone. It still has its power then? Yeah, yeah. And then I remember watching like things like Banana. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and Cucumber. Um, but they were very rare. So, I mean, what I hope to do is just instead of making it the gay show or the thing... I've decided pretty much all my work is going to be LGBT because that's my normal. And everywhere's like, everything's straight. <laughs> and yeah, so I'm just going to do the opposite and make sure that everything I do is gay because that is normal. And it, I don't want it to be classed as gay. It's just a film. <laughs> like if it's a romance, it doesn't. it's not a gay romance. It's just a romance between two people. And that's what I want to do. Yeah. It's because your generation don't do labels. <laughs> <laughs> do you see trans people represented in the correct way on TV and film? No. How are they represented? I mean, when they are represented, it's in a TV show, it's like a sideline story. Um, and if it's a short or something, often it's just about this harrowing journey of like, let's say it's a FTM guy and they're in the school and they realize that, oh, they're different from everybody else and they're actually a man. Um, and then it's all about this journey of going from A to B. And then once they're accepted, then they do like mechanics with their father because now they're a true man. <laughs> and it's just like, I, 
I don't think that's the reality of it. And I think we need to push the dialogue further than, yeah, just simple, this is a man, this is a woman, um, and these classic stories. How can you ensure that these stories are told correctly? I think just listen to people. <laughs> um, to trans the, people? Yeah, and I think that's, the, like, the basic <laughs> thing about it uh, i mean just talking to pete he's an actor and he's struggling mm -hmm. and he's only getting casted as either the trans guy or like why can't pete be casted in just like a, a man role like that's never been done and the trans not be talked about at all why why does it have to be even spoken about um i think it's really tough for trans actors now because they're pigeonholed into like these small roles and it should there should be a lot more so how do you ensure that they they get those roles that pete is just playing just some lad not trans lad pete well i'm gonna cast that in the future if i do well mm -hmm. <laughs> um but i think again it's just like speaking about it like here um and people start listening to the younger generation and um how they should be represented i think i think we are on the way to some change happening but um i think we've got a bit to go are lgbtqi plus stories too tragic at the moment <laughs> yeah probably <laughs> yeah um i love to do in my work um share some optimism and some queer happiness because I think that's needed in the world, mm -hmm. especially in like these dark times with <laughs> Trump and COVID and everything. Um, I think we need to celebrate a little bit and celebrate our community and be proud of ourselves and share that with the world that we are happy and we have lives and we have other stories to tell. And we're not just victims. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so a few final questions. What advice can you give to creatives young middle-aged or old if they're just starting out what advice can you give them these creatives and these filmmakers what advice um tell a story that you know um i prefer stories that are grounded in reality and if you've got something to say that hasn't been heard don't be afraid to share something that's deep and you're kind of covering just Tell your story. Just be authentic. Exactly. Because I think um, that's what people are interested in. They want to see and hear you. Don't try and be anything else. Yeah. I personally believe that all creators have this hideous negative voice in the back of their <laughs> head saying, no, this isn't for you. You're not good enough. You shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> How do you deal with that? How do I deal with that? Um don't worry about it <laughs> you just you do you do some writing and then you go this is awful <laughs> and then you go, you step away for a week and then you go i'll make it better and slowly just to me filmmaking is the only thing that i like doing and it's how i love spending my time so um even when i'm i know that this is awful i think well, I'll try and make it better. And that's all you can do. But do you not get those moments where it's just so crushingly overwhelming in the moment that you <laughs> can't get past that voice? Step away and watch a film. <laughs> that's what I do. I procrastinate. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I you think... just delay. Yeah. We all have, like, loads of doubts. Um, yeah. But... It's just taking that breath, go for a walk, get out, meet some friends, have a drink, talk about your problems and have it, having a good support system around you. You people. feel you've got a good support system? Yeah, like my boyfriend and friends, I think. Um, when I'm freaking out, they help me bring myself down to earth. <laughs> I'm like, it's okay. Awesome. But, yeah. Abel, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, and you're heading back to London now, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was the Iris Prize 2020 podcast. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your pods from. We will see you soon. See ya.